Hi there. In this quick video, I'm just going to go through the elements of how I created this scene. I used this scene in a previous tutorial, and I'll put a link on the screen now if you want to go and look at that. That was about how the reflections in the pool were made to look quite good, where the default reflections that you'll get from EV, and this was done in EV, tend not to be such good reflections. But there's a little trick you can do to make them much better. So I'm going to go through in this tutorial how all of this is just basically put together. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in each individual item. I've covered a lot of this in some of my previous videos. So here's the scene and you can see we've got a lot of trees. I've got a little figure there, some lamps in the scene that you can't see so well because they're obscured partly by the trees and some grass and some rocks and a pool. So if we just back off, we can see it's actually quite a big scene. I probably didn't need as many trees as I've got, but you can also see that there's cleared areas where we don't have trees or plants or rocks. So they're not just everywhere and obscured. They're actually only where they need to be, at least as far as the rocks and the grass is concerned. So a little bit about how I created the trees. The trees are actually fairly straightforward. I'm going to disable the particles from the view just to help the viewport move a little quicker. There we go. That's a lot better. And if we look over here, you can see I've got a number of versions of the trees. So I just created these with the sapling generator. Just make sure it's turned on under preferences. If you look for sapling, you can see it's add curve sapling tree gen. And the fact that it says add curve to begin with gives you a clue of where you're going to find it. There are a number of default trees within there. And if you develop your own, you can add them as well. So just quickly, if we go to curve, you can see We've got the sapling tree gen. Now it goes and creates it over in the center of the display. It's obviously where I've got the landscape at the moment. So I'll just delete that one and we'll just hide everything. If I now add sapling tree, you can see we get a default tree there and we can bring up the controls over here and there will be some presets. I think it was small pine that I used. Doesn't look much like the ones I've got yet. But if we come over to here and select leaves and we turn on leaves, now you can see it's starting to look better. We can affect the scale of the leaves like this. So making the, basically the pine needles longer and under geometry, we can adjust the branch distribution. So if we went to 1.3, for example, that changes it a little bit. I've gone for one here. So you can play around with those settings. Once you've got a tree which you like the look of, you can save that as your own preset and then create a new one in the way that I just did. But each time you create it, you can use a different random seed, which will give you a variation on the tree. And you can do that anyway. You don't necessarily have to adjust any of the settings. So once you're happy with it, we don't need these settings anymore. Because it's a nighttime scene, there's only a limited amount of color and what have you visible. So I didn't have to spend too long on setting those up. If you look in here, we can see that I've got Pine bark as one of the settings, just basically a dark color. There's nothing particularly special about that one and you can't see it in the scene. And now if I select the leaves, I've got pine needles. What you'll need to do though is the pine needles will already be a mesh, but the tree itself will be a curve. That's actually quite useful. You can play around with the shape of the tree, but bear in mind that the needles won't move with the tree automatically. You'll need to move them as well if you do that. So if we go here, right click and just say convert to mesh and now I'll select the pine needles hold the shift key and select the trunk control J and they're now joined together so if I just select that you can see that's joined if you look at the bottom you can see there's the origin point just make sure that that is just inside the tree so that the tree goes all the way to the ground when you add it as a particle system you can see that's not looking too bad we select the pine needle material and we have a look at the shader editor. You can see it's just a basic material. I've got a little bit of roughness on there because they were a bit too reflective. You could put a little bit of subsurf on there if you want, or maybe a little bit of transmission just to let a bit of light through. But I didn't feel it was really that necessary. It depends on how close they're going to be to the camera. You can then create some variations of the tree as I did. So you can see what I did was I created three basic versions of the pine tree. They're all based on the same parameters, but with some variation added. And then I modified, I basically stretched them to give larger trees. And then I just created just to have a few non pine trees in there, these sort of birch trees. And again, that's essentially a default. You don't need to necessarily create them all themselves. I created some grass. You can see here it is. So it's just groups of grass. This works quite a bit better than trying to create just individual blades. And I created, these are actually ferns as well. I didn't end up using them, but you can see they've got alpha textures on them so that they look like ferns. I didn't use them as I say. For the rocks, as I've shown before, I used the rock generator. Again, make sure that's enabled. 
add mesh rock. So again, that gives you a clue as to where it is. So under mesh, we've got a rock generator. You click that. Again, we've got our options here. So this will determine the number of rocks. But to begin with, we just put the settings we want on there. So if we put the roughness up a little bit, maybe to three, detail up a little bit, and I'll put this display detail up so that we can see a bit more of it. And then we can say how many rocks we want. So that's two, three. I would say generally no less than three and at least six is probably better. It does create them all on top of each other. So you won't see them properly until you move them out. Then you can just select them just move them out like this. So there's half a dozen rocks that we've created. Now they're not unwrapped as yet. So I'm going to add my rock material, which is actually called moss. And then I can select all the other rocks, finally selecting the one with the material on it and just say over here, copy material to selected. Now they may be fine as they are, or you may need to play around. I didn't unwrap these, but the material I created, it looks a bit complicated. I'll explain it is using texture coordinates. So you can see I'm not using UV because they haven't been UV unwrapped. I'm using generated coordinates for part of it and I'm using just object coordinates for the rest. So I've got an image file here which is sort of mossy rocks. That's being mixed in with a noise texture with a color ramp on it. So the color ramp sort of selects part of the noise, just a basic noise texture, very low scale, only three. So that's quite infrequent as it were. That noise is actually setting the mix of this mix shader. So it's mixing between this rock and stone image and everything that's going on over here. And that was done in order to avoid lots of harsh lines, which you'll tend to get because the rock hasn't been unwrapped. It's your choice. If you unwrap it properly, you'll only tend to get one seam unless you have a, a good seamless material or texture. And here I've got a couple of noise textures at different scales. That one's at 10, that one's at just under 80. Some color ramps to play around with what parts of the noise I'm selecting. I'm using this one to mix between a sort of light green and a darker green. And then I'm overlaying on that a sort of orangey color based on this second noise texture. So it's varying the color slightly, playing around with the gamma a little bit just to make it sort of darker and stronger. And then that's mixed with that original noise texture up here with our rock layer texture and that all goes into the color on a principled shader. I'm also taking from this noise texture up here an output to go into a bump map, which obviously gives some surface texture, which you can just about see there on the rocks. And then just to add a little bit more finer texture, again, I'm using a texture cord and I could have brought it in from the texture coordinate over there, but it's just as easy to put another node in. I'm using a noise texture. It's going into a multiply node, but the node has got a value of 0.1, so it's effectively dividing it by 10. You can use a divide node if you prefer. And then that's going into displacement. So that's just adding some more displacement on the surface, some more texture to the surface of the rock. Well, that's it for the rocks. And then we can come over to the landscape. So obviously I've got a very poorly tiled texture here, but because you can't see it very well, it doesn't matter too much. And I've done what I often do, which is although the texture or the material on the ground that you can see is this top one, I've also added a lot of the other materials that I'm using to the ground because it just makes it easy to select them and change them, even though they're not visible on the ground, rather than having to go and find the object. Because of course with particles or geometry node particles, you can't select the particle itself to look at the material properties. You have to go back to the original object which I've got off to one side. And especially when you've got a lot of particles in the scene, that's a lot of messing around and can be a bit slow. So it's easier just to put the materials on the landscape. Again, doing something similar to what I did on the rocks, I've got my basic material. I did unwrap this one, so I didn't need to add a texture coordinate, a color ramp that's playing around with it and some adjustments on that because I didn't want the ground to be too reflective. And then that's going into roughness. So basically what I'm doing is I'm using the texture to create a roughness map, but I'm offsetting that roughness and scaling it down. So it's scaled down a long way and it's got an offset of 0.3 in order to make sure that we're not starting at zero. And then that just gives us a little bit of variation in the roughness or shininess, if you like, of the ground. And then I'm doing something similar to create a bump map as well based off the material. Obviously, if you've got a material that has a separate bump map texture to go with it, then you can just use that. And again, I'm just adding some noise texture through a multiply node, again, 0.05 into displacement to give us some more surface texture. And you can see from this angle, most of the tiling isn't that visible. And of course, once additional things are added into the landscape, it's not visible at all. So I created some dips in the ground in order to show the water and I added the water plane. So very basic material on this one. For some of the renders, I actually used this over here as well. So if I put that back in, what you'll see is something changes and now we've got some texture on the surface of that water. 
So all it is is essentially a glossy shader. I did look at making the water slightly transparent as well. So I added transparent shader down here and then I add a, added a layer weight node. I used the facing output to mix between essentially the glossy shader and the transparent shader. So the idea is that because how well you can see into water or any transparent material depends on the angle you're looking at it because of the amount of light that's reaching you, by putting this on, it simulates that effect. So if you have, for example, if you look at a pool of water from a, an angle that's very low down, you'll probably just see all the reflections. You probably won't be able to see into the water. But as you come from much higher up, you may be able to see all the fish swimming about. And that's what this simulates. The viewport's struggling to keep up a little bit there. So I'll just move it round to here. And you can see it's just catching up now, but it's much darker there because we're sort of looking into the water. Whereas if I look from the camera's viewpoint, there's a lot more light reflecting. And you control how much of that happens with this blend here. The point is that that has more of an effect when you have some surface texture. So I've got, for example, a wave texture here. I'm going to come out of that because it's slowing things down. I've got a wave texture here set to rings. So they're like giant ripples. I've got some distortion on it and then played around with the detail and the roughness. Then I've just got basically a noise texture. I'm mixing these two together. It's mostly the noise texture with a little bit of the wave texture. And then that's feeding into a bump map, which is going into the glossy's normal input. If I turn this way back to here and we just have a look at the preview, you can see the waves a little more, more significantly there. We go all the way back. They are noisy waves though, so it is quite a subtle effect. Or I can put the strength up to 0.1 and you can see they're much bigger now. For the animation, I took that out because I was trying to just optimize how quickly everything happened. As I talk about in my previous tutorial, of course, I needed to add a reflection plane set to the right height so that I got good, strong reflections through the water. So you can see there, even in the viewport, those are quite nice reflections now. Without the reflection plane, you can see they don't look anything like as good, but they work more quickly, of course. So if I select my ground again and we come to here, you can see I've got three vertex groups. So if I select the trees one and just say select, so you can see all of these vertices are where trees will occur. And I'll show how that happens in a moment. If I select the grass one, this is where I wanted grass and the rocks one, this is where I wanted rocks. So that's three vertex groups. The reason it looks a little odd in terms of the geometry is because I decided to extend it a little after I'd created the landscape, but it doesn't matter. It's not visible. So then we go to our geometry node. So if I come to here and look at the geometry node editor, you can see basically got three rows of geometry nodes. So if we start with the top one, again, I've shown how to do this before. We have a point distribute node. So that determines the density of points that are going to be used as position markers, if you like, for where I have particles. And I've also got the trees vertex group referenced here. Essentially, these two things work together such that I get no density out here and up to 0.1 density in here. I've then got a scale modifier so that I can adjust the overall scale of my particles. Here we've got a randomized node, which is to give me some variation of each particle. So each one will vary between 0.25 of its original size and one. This will adjust the overall size, but this will vary the size of each particle. And then I've got another attribute randomized node. This one is for rotation. And because these are trees, obviously they don't rotate very much on any other axis than their vertical axis. So I've got 300 for the max variation, naught to 300 on the vertical axis, Z, but I have added a tiny little bit of naught to 0.1 on the other two axes because you do get a little bit of variation even in a relatively flat scene. And finally, to define the particles that I want, I have to determine what I'm going to instantiate. If I go back to my particles over here, what I did was I selected my group of particles. So for example, all of these trees, and I think I said just selected all of them and I added them into a collection. So I pressed M and I said new collection and I called that the trees collection. So I set this to collection, not whole collection because it will instantiate all of the trees each time, which you don't necessarily want to do, just collection and then told it which collection to use. So this one was called trees one and you can see I've got a trees one collection here with the trees in it. So that was all placed between the group input and the group output and that gave me my trees. However, I also wanted to do exactly the same with a few different numbers, obviously, for the grass and for the rocks. So I created duplicate geometry nodes and then added this join geometry node. By adding a connection from the geometry itself into that join geometry node, that allowed this 
to be actually visible. If I break that one, when that geometry node is active, you'll see the ground will actually disappear. I've got all my particles, but the ground has disappeared. So I need to join that one in here with this join geometry node. And of course, I did exactly the same with all of the other nodes, just joining them in like that. And that allows me to just have one geometry group to do everything. Now, obviously, I could have just created three separate geometry node modifiers and then I'd be able to independently turn them on and off. But I didn't need to do that. So I decided to just do it all in one. I then just animated the camera. You probably can't see it in the video at the beginning and I'll put the video at the end as well. But I put a little armature in this character just so that I could rotate his head slightly as the animation progressed. And of course, there's one last thing I need to show and that's under the shader editor. If we go to world, I use a little technique I've used a lot to creating the stars. So I've got the world output here. I've got a mix shader into one side is a background node set to very dark blue, strength 0.7 in this case, and then another one set to white, but with a very high strength of 15. And then I've got a noise texture set to a high number, in this case 2000, going into a color ramp with detail at 16, could even be higher. And then the color ramp set to cardinal, which is not completely on or off, but is a very high contrast. And then the two points set very close together here. You can see I've got one set to 7.64 and the other one to 7.95. The exact numbers don't matter too much, but it, the fact that they're very close together and that sets the density of stars that you get. And that just switches between black and white, essentially. That gives me my starry background. And just to add light to the scene, I've also got a sun lamp in the scene set to a slightly blue color because it's supposed to simulate the moon. I've got a moon shape here, I should have said, and I'm using a moon image just onto a sphere that's been projected. So select all the vertices, press U, and I just projected from view because we're not really going to see any change on that. The other thing I did with the moon, because I'm using a sun lamp, which effectively, even though it's here, is off in the infinite distance, I set shadow mode to none, and that stopped it casting a shadow. You can see material will cast no shadows. And finally, I added a mist layer. I actually played around with the mist. I used generated coordinates, rotated them 90 degrees on the Y as it happens, and added an easing gradient texture. I didn't end up using the multiply. You can see it's set to one, but I made some adjustments in the color ramp, and I also flipped it, as you can see set to be spline so it's very gradual, rescaled it to much smaller so 0.05 and then fed that into the density of a volume scatter node which is at a slightly off white and then that went into the volume for the material output and the idea of that was just to give me a graded mist as it were that's denser toward the bottom of the screen and gets less dense as it goes up. I turn the particles off again so you can see there got a, a denser mist here but it then gets less dense as it goes up and I did that partly for artistic reasons and partly in order to make sure that the stars would be visible. I hope you enjoyed that quick run through on how I created that scene. Again, my previous tutorial covers how I created the reflections in this and I also passed along the file for this to my patrons. If you'd like to see more tutorials, don't forget to click like and particularly subscribe. I'll see you in the next tutorial. Thanks a lot then.